All righty. Okay. Well, welcome everybody. Um, thank you all for joining us on this beautiful Thursday evening. If you are from the Vegas area, it's finally starting to uh, get to the most beautiful weather in the year. So we have all of the windows open in the house and it feels really great. Um, but before we get started, uh, I want to respectfully acknowledge that myself and our speaker are from the traditional lands of the Nuwuvi or Southern Paiute in Las Vegas and the Spokane tribe where our speaker is located in Spokane, Washington. These people have been living on and with these lands for countless generations. And we pay our respects to elders past, present, and future. And I would like you to take a moment uh, to consider the many legacies of colonization that bring us here today. And with that, I am Clarice Wheeler and I am hosting tonight. Um, I use she, her pronouns and I am the Southern Nevada Programs Coordinator at Friends of Nevada Wilderness. Friends of Nevada Wilderness is a statewide nonprofit, nonprofit focused on protecting wild lands. Wilderness areas are natural landscapes that are largely unaffected by people. We protect these lands in a few main ways. So we advocate by speaking up for these lands to get them permanently protected and manage to maintain their wildness. We educate by sharing the values and vision of wilderness at community events, presentations just like this one, and finding common ground to protect our wildland heritage. And we steward because these lands cannot protect themselves. We work with volunteers on the ground to help monitor, restore, and improve access to these special places. We hold this wild speaker series every Thursday, every first Thursday of the month by hosting a local environmental expert for people who are interested in learning more about the outdoors and ways to get involved with conservation efforts. Tonight, we're learning about beavers from none other than a professional beaver believer. Beavers have a surprising and profound impact on our ecosystems and their ability to shift and create habitats is often taken for granted. They are the largest rodents in North America and are brilliant engineers of aquatic ecosystems, creating habitats for a variety of species that rely on their woodwork to survive. Now let me introduce you to our speaker. Tonight we are joined by author, editor, and environmental journalist Ben Goldfarb. His book, the content of which we will be discussing tonight, is called Eager, The Surprising Secret Life of Beavers and Why They Matter. It won the 2019 P Pen EO Wilson Literary Science Writing Award and has been proclaimed by the Washington Post as one of the best books of 2018. Ben's journalism work has also been featured in big name publications such as The Guardian, The Atlantic, Science, National Geographic, Scientific American, The New York Times, and many more. He is currently working on a new book called Roadside Ecology, which I'm sure he might briefly tell us about tonight. Before I hand things off to Ben, I have a few housekeeping notes. Um, if you're not speaking, please keep yourself on mute. If we start to have bandwidth issues, I might turn everybody's cameras off so their speaker can come through clearly. And lastly, so you all know, the event is live on Facebook and being recorded. Recordings will go up on our Facebook and YouTube channel to, or early next week. Can't guarantee it'll go up tomorrow. Um, please drop your questions in the chat throughout the presentation and we'll get to them once the presentation is finished. Um, and also if you have, if anything stands out to you, we'd also love to hear it, even if you don't have questions. And with that, I'll pass it off to you, Ben. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you much. Thank, thank you so much, Clarice, for that introduction. And thanks to you all um, for, being here, how does that how does that look? Is that all? Is that sharing properly? Great. Um, so yeah, I, I live up in uh, in Spokane, Washington, but I've, I've certainly spent uh, plenty of time in your your neck of the country, and it's it's a really a really beautiful spot and, and surprisingly beavery uh, in in Nevada. And we'll get into a little bit of uh, Nevada local beaver context tonight tonight as well. Um, so so tonight I'll be talking a lot about beavers as ecological tools that we can deploy on the landscape to restore streams and accomplish various environmental goals. But before we sort of get into uh, how we use beavers, you know, I thought it's important to sort of establish some basic facts uh, about what a beaver is. What are these kind of world changing rodents that we'll be discussing tonight? Uh, so beavers, of course, are semi-aquatic rodents. They spend uh, their lives in and around water and they've got all kinds of fantastic 
uh, features for this unique semi-aquatic niche they fill. Uh, of course, they've got extraordinarily dense fur, one of the densest pelts in the animal kingdom. So they've got as many individual hairs on a postage stamp size patch of skin as we have on our entire head. So they've got these wonderful, uh, re remarkably thick pelts, which of course were their downfall. And we'll talk about that in a, in a minute. Uh, they've got these wonderful webbed duck-like hind feet. They're very powerful, agile swimmers. They can stay underwater for up to 15 minutes. Uh, so they're, they're great uh, in the water. Uh, they've got a second set of transparent eyelids that, that uh, function as goggles, uh, as well as a second set of fur-lined lips, kind of like a valve that they can close behind their front teeth so they can, they can chew and drag branches underwater uh, without drowning. I think that's a really cool uh, adaptation. Uh, and then, of course, what's the beaver's most iconic, recognizable feature? It's, it's tail, of course. And, it's all kinds of different functions. Uh, you know, most conspicuously, it's an alarm system, right? So if you've ever spent time around a beaver pond, you've probably heard them smack their tail in the water to warn other beavers about the presence of predators. Uh, it's also a fat storage device. They put on fat for the winter uh, in their tails, uh, as well as a thermoregulatory system, a kickstand while they're out on land, uh, and a rudder while they're swimming. So the tail is kind of this wonderful Swiss army knife of an appendage. Uh, and then, of course, the other recognizable iconic beaver feature is their, their teeth. Uh, beavers, as you can see, uh, have sort of chisel-like teeth. So the top and bottom incisors kind of file each other into points. Uh, and the teeth are orange, uh, which is because they're, they're sort of chemically and structurally fortified by iron, with be which beavers derive from their, from their food. So beavers have incredibly durable, uh, powerful teeth, which of course is a, a big advantage when you spend your whole life uh, cutting down trees. Uh, so beavers are, they, you know, they, they eat the cambium of trees. Um, so the, that's the kind of the inner layer of bark, the stuff that does the growing. Uh, preferred beaver trees, cottonwood, willow, aspen, those are kind of the big three uh, out here in the, the American West. But they'll, you know, they're, they're what scientists call choosy generalists. So they've got a few species they really like, but they'll eat just about any deciduous tree, uh, as well as lots of green herbaceous vegetation, uh, you know, cattails and water lilies. I've seen them basically mow people's lawns for them. They, they graze pretty happily too. Um, so of course, in addition to cutting down trees to eat the cambium, the inner bark, uh, they're also using the wood as construction material. Uh, here's a, a beaver uh, doing, doing just that in, uh, in Minnesota. Uh, and there are two basic types of, of beaver structure. Uh, the first is the lodge. That's kind of the, the fundamental beaver housing unit. Um, so you can sort of see in this picture, there are underwater tunnels that lead up and into the lodge. And then there's a kind of an elevated uh, nesting chamber inside the lodge. And in the lodge, you've got, you know, a typical beaver colony or family is two to as many as eight beavers. And that's the male and female, the mating pair who are generally monogamous. Uh, and then you've got three generations of, of offspring or three year classes of offspring, the newborn kits, the baby beavers, the one year olds and the two year olds. So you know, kind of like a human family, you've got all the brothers and sisters uh, hanging out in the lodge, helping each other out. Um, you know, the older siblings kind of teach the, the younger ones the, the finer points of, uh, of, of dam and lodge construction. And then, you know, during their second year, those two year olds will disperse off uh, looking for their own territory, kind of like uh, teenagers heading off for, for college. So of course, in addition to the, the lodge, you know, the other classic beaver structure that we all uh, know and love is, is the beaver dam. Uh, so why do beavers build dams? What's the, the point of this really unique specialized behavior? Why go to all the trouble? Well, uh, you know, beaver on land uh, is, as, as one biologist put it to me, uh, a fat, slow, smelly package of meat, right? Beavers get, uh, they get eaten by, Cougars, wolves, black bears, coyotes. Uh, here's what here's kind of what happened to uh, this is all that's left of a beaver that ventured onto land and also in Minnesota. Uh, this is a, the victim of a, a wolf a wolf predation episode. Uh, and the wolf the wolf the wolves actually eat the entirety of the beaver. They just leave behind uh, the mandible and the lower incisors. They actually 
consume the pelt and the, the bones and everything. So you don't want to be a beaver on land, right? Um, whereas a beaver uh, in, in water, of course, is, is comparatively safe. Again, they're, they're really wonderful swimmers uh, and they can, they can evade predators pretty, pretty well as long as they stay in water. So by building that dam and creating that nice deep pool, they're basically expanding the extent of their habitat, right? Instead of having to walk over land uh, to cut down that good looking willow, they can swim up to it instead and be, be relatively safe. So don't want to be a beaver on land. Uh, and you know, beaver dams come in all kinds of different shapes and sizes. Uh, you know, often beaver colonies are building up to a dozen dams. There's usually one big primary dam uh, and then a number of smaller kind of secondary dams. Uh, you know, here's a, a, a nice little modest dam in uh, in Montana that's probably you know three feet high and one foot tall. It's a you know a pretty uh, humble little structure, but they do get quite a bit bigger. Um, here's, I think, a, a pretty spectacular uh, bit of construction in, this is also in, in Minnesota, where some of the best beaver structure uh, exists. And, you know, this is, this dam is 15 feet high and probably six to 800 feet long, uh, and is obviously the work of many generations of beavers all adding their stick to the pile. So, you know, left in, in the right situation, left to their own devices, they can really uh, achieve some, some spectacular stuff. Uh, and of course, you know, there's these massive beaver dams um, are often impounding huge extents of water, right? Here's a, a, you know, a beaver pond that's probably 250 to 300 acres created by a single strategically placed beaver dam. Uh, you know, I, I often feel like, you know, if you, if you took a, an engineer from the Army Corps to a stream and said, okay, where would you build a dam to minimize labor and maximize the total impoundment, uh, the beavers generally choose the exact same spot that the human engineers would. Uh, so they're, they're, you know, I'm always impressed by their, their kind of their hydrological savvy. Uh, the other really important beaver feature we don't, that we don't talk about enough, I think, is, is canal digging. You know, beavers, in addition to being fantastic builders, are also great excavators. And they, they dig these really uh, impressive, elaborate networks of canals that they use to kind of navigate their habitat uh, and swim up into the forest, cut down a tree, and then float it back down the canal. Uh, and, you know, and these, and these canal networks can cover, you know, many hundreds of feet uh, and extend really far away from the pond. And, or, you know, they, those end up being really important habitat features for baby fish and amphibians and all, all kinds of critters. So that canal digging is, a, I think, a really important way that be beavers modify the landscape, uh, as well as building dams. So here's what it looks like when you all kind of put it together. Uh, this is a, a dam complex in, uh, in Colorado. This is about 12,000 feet uh, in the Rockies near the Continental Divide. Uh, so they really get way the, way the heck up there. Uh, and you can just see you know, that the stream kind of comes meandering along. Uh, and then all of these linear features here uh, are, are beaver dams. And beavers are obviously storing hundreds of thousands, if not millions of gallons of water uh, in this little valley, uh, impounding just tremendous volumes of, of stream and, and dramatically modifying the landscape and keeping that water in this valley and, and really uh, irrigating it and hydrating it at a, a pretty impressive scale. So of course, beavers are, are building dams and creating ponds to improve their own habitat. But in the process, they're improving habitat for all kinds of other critters as well, right? Beavers are what scientists call a, a keystone species, a species that you know, disproportionately supports a, a lot of weight in an ecosystem. You know, we know that here in the American West, uh, water is life, right? Wetlands cover just 2% of total land area, uh, but support 80% of biodiversity. And any animal that's capable of building and creating wetlands starts to look pretty important, right? Uh, so all kinds of creatures take advantage of the, the habitats that beavers create. Um, here's a, a great blue heron rookery uh, at a beaver complex that I visited in, in Wisconsin. So all kinds of aquatic uh, birds, you know, wading birds, waterfowl, um, even passerine songbirds do really well in kind of the coppicing willows uh, that surround a, a beaver pond. Some fantastic bird habitat. Uh, lots of semi-aquatic mammals, you know, moose, muskrat, mink. Here's a, a moose hanging out uh, in a beaver pond in, in uh, Utah. Um, here, I think, is a kind of a, a cool, a cool example uh, of, of beaver-created habitat. This is a, a, a beaver lodge. Again, this is in, in Minnesota. Uh, you can see that you know, this, this kind of flat, um, meadowy area it used to be underwater. This was all a, a big beaver pond once. Then beavers left the area. Uh, the pond drained. The lodge was exposed. And uh, a pack of wolves actually moved into the lodge and raised their pups in the beaver lodge. So that's beavers creating habitat for their direct predator. I think that's, that's pretty incredible. Uh, 
Uh, and then, a, you know, a really important beaver beneficiary, certainly here in, in Washington, but, you know, all, all over the, uh, the country is, is fish. Uh, you know, of course, if you're a juvenile fish like this, this baby steelhead, uh, you know, you don't want to live in the, the free flowing, fast moving river, you're just going to get, you know, blown downstream by the force of the current. What you want is a, a nice deep pool or a side channel or a, a little beaver canal. You want that slow water refuge habitat that, uh, that beavers create. And uh, you know, so here in, in Washington, you know, rainbow trout and steelhead and other salmonids are kind of the, the, the primary beneficiary. Uh, and you know, in Nevada, there's, there's lots of great examples of, of beavers creating habitat for Lahontan cutthroat trout, uh, you know, which is your, your state fish, I believe. So that beaver fish connection is really what drives a lot of the interest in beavers, uh, certainly here, here in the Northwest and, and uh, really around the country. Uh, of course, one common objection uh, that, that you often hear um, is that, well, wait a second, you know, aren't dams bad for fish, right? We're trying to take structures out of rivers for the sake of fish migration, uh, not put dams in two rivers. And actually, you know, in, in the Truckee River uh, for a long time, you know, the Forest Service just habitually and reflexively dynamited uh, beaver dams to quote unquote improve habitat for, for kokanee salmon, which I think is actually pretty ironic, right? They're, destroying the work of a native mammal to improve the habitat for an introduced fish. That's kind of an interesting uh, paradox, I think. Um, but, you know, of course, fish have no problem getting around uh, beaver dams. You know, fish, think they can jump over beaver dams. Uh, they can swim, they can wriggle through the structure itself. They often migrate during periods of high flow when water's going around the, the beaver dam. Um, you know, here's a kind of a, a nice example. This is a stream outside of, uh, outside of Seattle. Uh, and here you can see, here's the, the beaver dam, uh, here's the upstream pool, and here are the two uh, freshly excavated uh, coho salmon nests. So at least two fish had no problem whatsoever uh, navigating this, this beaver dam. And in fact, you know, the, the evolutionary connection uh, between beavers and fish in, is so deep uh, that it inspired my favorite bumper sticker, which is that beavers taught salmon to jump. I think, I think that, gets at the, that gets at the connection nicely. Um, so, of course, you know, we know, we know that uh, once upon a time there were, there were far more beavers in North America than there are today. Today there are perhaps 10 to 15 million beavers on this continent, um, so they're certainly not an endangered species. They're, you know, they're, they're pretty abundant, uh, but, you know, they exist at a tiny fraction uh, of the numbers they used to exist at, right? Before European colonization, we don't know exactly how many beavers uh, lived in North America, but, you know, the best estimate we have is that there were as many as 400 million beavers. Uh, in, in, in this continent. Uh, and of course, all of those beavers would have created hundreds of millions of beaver ponds uh, and impounded hundreds, uh, certainly hundreds of thousands of square miles of, of land. Uh, you know, a little back of the envelope math suggests that perhaps 235,000 square miles were underwater, which for the sake of reference uh, is about the size of, of Nevada and Arizona put together. So just imagine you know, your entire state underwater and, and that was the sort of, you know, what, keep, what beavers were capable of at, at a, a continent wide uh, scale. Uh, and you know, I think it's I think it's important too to to remember that, you know, native people uh, in North America understood the the ecological importance of beavers long, of, of course, long before uh, white colonists did. Um, you know, the the Blackfeet, for example, in Montana, actually sanctified beavers uh, and refused to kill them because they knew that in an arid landscape, you know, these these animals were creating these vital oases uh, on the on the northern plains. And a lot of Western tribes had similar prohibitions against against killing beavers because they recognized uh, the the ecological importance of this animal. So tonight, you know, I'll be talking about you know, the, the value of beavers and, and the, the rationale for restoring them. But, you know, I want to emphasize that's, that's not new to Western science, of course. It's something that Native people understood, uh, certainly for many thousands of years. So a lot of what I tried to do in, in working on this book is just sort of uh, help recreate, recreate what North America looked like with 400 million beavers. Uh, and, you know, you go, when you go back through old trappers journals and explorers diaries and railroad survey reports and native histories, you know, you, you start to realize that, that once, um, 
this continent was a lot greener and bluer and wetter and lusher uh, than it is today, and that these these animals were once truly ubiquitous. Uh, you know, Lewis and Clark, for example, described uh, you know going up the Missouri Basin in Montana and seeing beavers uh, in every single tributary that you know their dams going back as far as the eye could see uh, upstream into the into the mountains. Uh, so these are just, you know unbelievably abundant animals. You know there I mean, there are other accounts of explorers crossing uh, you know the state of what is today Indiana uh, and not finding a dry place to camp for a hundred miles because everything was so impounded by beavers. And you know there are descriptions of uh, other other you know, early colonists uh, you know in in Utah and and eastern Wyoming you know places that we kind of think of as deserts today finding these amazing uh, marshes full of waterfowl and you know a lot of that was was the doing of beavers so anyway that was it that was in um, in 1805 that Lewis and Clark, you know, described seeing beaver dams in every tributary of the Missouri River as far as the eye could see. Uh, in 1843, just 38 years later, John James Audubon, of course, the naturalist and painter, traveled the exact same route uh, looking for a beaver to paint, and he couldn't find a single beaver uh, in a place where Lewis and Clark had seen them everywhere less than four decades earlier. So what happened to beavers in just 38 years? Where did they go? What did they turn into? Uh, well, of course, they turned into hats, right? Uh, you know, I think we often hear the phrase beaver hat and think of like a big fluffy Davy Crockett-like thing, but beaver hats were these kind of elegant uh, Victorian style top hats that were all the rage uh, in, in Europe for many centuries. Uh, and, you know, the beaver, the industrial beaver trade really begins in the early 1600s in, in North America, uh, in New England, and, and pretty rapidly spreads west and southeast uh, or south across the continent. Um, you know, by the early 1800s, uh, it's, it's the fur trade has reached uh, has reached your part of the country, the, 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 uh, the kind of the arid American west. And, uh, you know, it's really hard to overstate the extent to which the fur trade was a, a driver of early American history. You know, beaver pelts along with timber and cod were really the most important or most valuable resources that Europeans discovered in the, the quote unquote uh, new world. Uh, you know, this is a, a beaver coin um, that was minted by the, the Oregon Territory in 1849, and the value of one beaver coin was fixed to the value of one beaver pelt. Uh, so the entire economy of the Northwest, and, you know, and, and I mean, certainly part of Nevada was included in the Oregon Territory as well. Um, you know, the entire economy of, of the Northwest operated on the, the pelt standard, uh, which, is, which is pretty incredible. And, you know, you think about every, practically every significant historical event prior to the Civil War had some kind of beaver connection. Uh, you know, the, the Revolutionary War, for example, one of the British offenses uh, that, that pissed off the colonists was denying them access to trapping grounds west of the Appalachian Mountains that helped incite the colonists to revolt. Uh, you know, the, the Louisiana Purchase, you know, part of that was fueled by Jefferson's desire to secure new trapping, trapping lands. Uh, and of course, you know, the smallpox and other diseases that were spread uh, to so many native tribes were spread by uh, white fur trappers and traders. So the story of the beaver trade is sort of the story of, of early American history and all of its you know, grandeur and, and uh, tragedy. So in addition to being a hugely significant uh, historical event, the fur trade was also this profoundly influential ecological event, right? We don't think about the fur trade in the same terms as we think about the deforestation of New England uh, or the busting of Midwestern Prairie or gold mining in the Sierra Nevada. We don't think about the fur trade as being this ecological catastrophe that shaped the, the continent, but, you know, but certainly it was. I mean, what happens when you trap hundreds of millions of beavers? Well, you, hundreds of millions of beaver dams break down and all of those ponds drain and you lose hundreds of millions of acres uh, of pond and, and wetland habitat uh, for all kinds of, of creatures that depended upon it. Uh, kind of ironically, the, the trapping of beavers created fantastic human habitat, right? It turns out that, you know, when you, when you drain a beaver pond, what do you get? You get this, you know, beautiful rock, rock free, treeless, fertile footprint, essentially, this wonderful swath of soil that, you know, that became uh, some of the best farmland uh, for, for early colonists. So in some ways, you know, beavers made agriculture possible uh, in places like New England, where the, the soil is, is very uh, rocky and infertile otherwise. So, you know, the, the fur trade 
both destroyed biodiversity uh, on this continent, but it actually paved the way uh, for, for human colonization. So the other really dramatic effect of the fur trade uh, is, was erosion and, and incision of streams. You know, in a, in a healthy beaver rich stream, right, all of those beaver dams are acting as speed bumps, slowing water down and spreading it out, pushing it out onto the floodplain, you know, creating these beautiful uh, fertile wetlands. But you know, when you lose all of those, all of those beaver built speed bumps, there's nothing checking the velocity of water. And you often get really dramatic and, and rapid erosion like this and a stream that's trapped in its banks and disconnected from its floodplains. So all of those wetlands uh, turned into you know, degraded uh, kind of desiccated pasture lands essentially and lost a lot of their biological productivity. So I think, you know, I think again, often we see streams like this uh, in the American West and think, well, this is, you know, something like this is the product of overgrazing or mining or some other impact. But in many, many cases, uh, it's, the, it's the product of the, the, the fur trade. Uh, and of course, that would have been, again, catastrophic for all kinds of creatures. This is a, a boreal toad, uh, an amphibian uh, that, that breeds almost exclusively uh, in, in beaver ponds. Um, so that, you know, certainly the loss of beavers would have represented a catastrophic decline um, for amphibian populations. Uh, and you know, out here in, in the Northwest, uh, you know, coho salmon were another uh, prime loser. You know, I mean, by by some estimates in some watersheds, uh, you know, the loss of beavers would have contributed to a 97% loss uh, in coho salmon rearing habitat. So again, just a kind of a profound biological apocalypse uh, resulting from the, the loss of beavers. So fortunately, you know, by the early 1900s, society started to wise up a little bit to recognize that, you know, hey, these are uh, actually pretty, pretty valuable critters, and uh, you know, all kinds of all kinds of states uh, begin to protect beavers from trapping, and in, in many cases, actually reintroduce them, uh, frequently using stock from Yellowstone National Park or or uh, or, or Canada. Um, so you know, there are big beaver relocation or reintroduction projects uh, that take place in in Utah. California, Oregon, Washington. I'm not sure if Nevada actually did any proactive beaver reintroduction in the, in the 20th century. That'd be a, that'd be a good thing to, to look at. Um, of course, the, the kind of the most famous beaver reintroduction project uh, occurred in, in Idaho uh, in 1948. You might have heard of this project. Uh, you know, there they were trying to, to reintroduce beavers to what is today the Frank Church Wilderness Area. Uh, at first, they tried relocating them on horseback. Uh, the horses didn't take very kindly to that, um, but you know it was 1948. It was just sort of post World War II. They had all of these uh, airplanes and surplus parachutes on hand, and uh, one of the biologists with the Idaho Fish and Game Department had the, the bright idea of actually airdropping some beavers uh, into the into the wilderness. Uh, so in, in 1948, they they released uh, 76 beavers um, via parachute. Uh, 75 of the beavers survived. One beaver, unfortunately, escaped from the crate in midair and fell to his death, very sad. Uh, but the next year, when they flew back over this, this same landscape, they found that beavers had established uh, dams and lodges in all the places where they'd been released. This is actually a, a very effective um, project. Nobody is, uh, is airdropping beavers anymore, um, but at the time, this was uh, considered quite, quite state of the art. And here's the beaver heading off into his new home. So you know, all throughout the 20th century, beavers are beginning to recover, right? They're being reintroduced, they're being protected, uh, and they're starting to recolonize uh, a lot of their former habitat. The problem, of course, is that we've colonized the same habitat in their absence, right? It turns out that good beaver habitat and good human habitat is kind of one and the same. You know, we both like uh, you know these broad, fertile floodplains and low gradient stream valleys. Uh, but the problem, of course, is that, you know, where, where our, our visions for the landscape are, are fundamentally different. You know, we like to kind of keep, keep the water flowing nice and orderly in its streams and irrigation canals and beavers like it spread all over the landscape. Uh, and when, you know, as, as beavers begin to sort of recolonize habitats that humans have moved into in their absence, conflict uh, inevitably occurs. You know, I'd, I'd argue that we're the, the, the nuisance species more than they are, but uh, you know, certainly they can be difficult to, to live alongside. Um, here's a, you know, an example of a, a set of railroad tracks in, in Massachusetts um, that uh, beavers flooded pretty much the minute the tracks were laid. Um, here's, a, I think, a nice example of, of a beaver conflict. This is in, in New Mexico, uh, a little cabin that I stumbled on near the Towski Valley. And this is a cool picture, I think, because you can see 
you can sort of see in this picture, so beavers, you know, they begin their dam over here in the, on the left-hand side of the screen, and then they dam up to the base of this cabin, and then they incorporate the cabin in their dam, and then they keep going on the, on the right-hand side. So that's, uh, I think that's, yeah, I wouldn't want to be this property owner, but you have to admire the, the ingenuity of the beavers in, in that case. Uh, of course, damming in road culverts is a, a very common beaver impact, right? For, you know, a beaver, the culvert, the little pipe is, is sort of the leak in the dam of the roadbed and beavers want to plug that leak. Uh, so often, you know, the water rises and the dam washes out. That's a, a very, probably the most common cause of beaver conflicts. Um, but they do get a little more creative. Here's a, a beaver that uh, was that broke into a dollar store in Maryland and was apprehended uh, browsing the, the plastic Christmas tree rack. So they get into all kinds of interesting, interesting trouble. Uh, of course, the way that those conflicts are usually handled is by, is by killing the offending beaver. Uh, every year, the federal government kills about 20,000 beavers. The Department of Agriculture uh, kills, kills 20,000 beavers or so. Private uh, you know, nuisance trappers kill certainly many tens and probably hundreds of thousands more. Uh, and, you know, certainly there's a, there's a kind of an intuitive logic to trapping out beavers, right? The beaver's causing a problem, get the beaver out of there. But, you know, the issue with that is, is twofold. I mean, first, you know, when you kill that beaver, you're also eliminating the potential for the, the pond and wetland habitat they create. Um, but also, you know, all you're doing is putting up a vacancy sign for the next family of beavers, right? As long as that, as long as that the culvert is still there, the beavers are always going to come back. Uh, so, you know, communities all over the country have ended up in this very expensive and I would argue inhumane cycle of trapping and recolonization and trapping and recolonization. So you start to wonder, well, you know, maybe there are better ways of solving these conflicts. You know, maybe we, maybe we can address these, these beaver conflicts non-lethally uh, in a kind of a, a more ecologically sensible way. So here's, you know, here's, I think, a, one nice example. Um, you know, beavers are frequently killed for cutting down trees, um, you know, both ornamental trees and, uh, you know, here in Washington, they're often killed for cutting down uh, apple trees, you know, we're kind of the biggest apple production region in the, in the United States. Um, but, you know, personally, I don't ever think that a beaver should be killed for cutting down a tree. It's just too easy a problem to solve. Uh, so, you know, here's a nice example. This is a, um, a reservoir in Colorado that I visited. Uh, where the local land manager, you know, they had these, these beautiful old cottonwood trees they wanted to protect, so they fenced off the, the cottonwoods, and then they left unfenced the non-native Siberian elm trees, and the beavers felled, felled those. So that's actually invasive vegetation management, uh, using beavers as your, your agent. I think that's a, a pretty cool um, case study. Uh, you know, and the issue is, is flooding. That's a little bit trickier to solve, but you know, there too, we've got options, right? This is what's known as a beaver deceiver uh, or a flow device. It's basically this pipe and fence system. You know, you run the pipe uh, through the beaver dam or through the culvert, you fence off the ends. And you're basically, you know, moving water from the upstream side to the downstream side, right? You're just draining that beaver pond to a level that both humans and, and beavers can tolerate. Uh, and here's one that I, I helped install recently uh, out here in Washington. And you can just see, you know, here's the, here's the dam, of course, here's the pond. Uh, and, you know, we put this in an hour earlier, and we've already dropped the water level, uh, you know, six inches or so, um, you know, helping to, to basically, you know, the, the house, the, you know, the property owner's house is off to the right here. And we're just, you know, trying try to protect that property um, while still giving the beavers an, enough water to, to uh, inhabit that site. Uh, you know, here's a here's a, another another kind of model, um, a flexible pond leveler. And uh, you know, I mean, these are you know maybe not every single situation is appropriate for for one of these flow devices. Um, but you know, where they've been tested, they've they've been found to be about you know 85 to 95 percent effective. So there's certainly there's no question that there are uh, you know thousands and thousands of sites all over the country that we're currently managing by trapping where we could be, um, you know, we could be using non-lethal techniques to, to solve these problems. Uh, and then, you know, the other, the other option we've got is, is beaver relocation, right? Is, is you know, live trapping uh, nuisance beavers and moving them uh, to sites that don't have beavers and, and kind of helping to repopulate the landscape that way. Uh, that's a, a very common uh, popular technique here in, here in Washington. Here's a, a, a nice uh, beaver, a non-lethal beaver trap, a Hancock trap. Um, here's a, a pair of beavers. This is Sandy and Chomper uh, being, uh, being moved to their, their new home uh, high up in the uh, Okanagan Wenatchee National Forest uh, on public land, you know, far from any, any private property. Um, so this is, you know, kind of a, a nice, a nice way of again repopulating some of these drainages that historically had beavers but but don't have them today. Um, 
oftentimes, you know, when you, re when you relocate beavers, of course, the problem you have is that, you know, you put them out in the landscape and they don't have that pond or, or lodge yet to be safe and they get eaten right away, right? There, you know, there, there are beaver projects that have kind of infamously uh, just fed cougars, um, you know, for, for, uh, for years on end. Um, so what, what a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of beaver projects have started doing now is, is building these kind of starter lodges uh, the beavers can move into and, and uh, you know, kind of hit the ground in a, in a safe way. And uh, here's a, the newly released beaver uh, enjoying his, his little starter lodge. Um, and frequently, uh, you know, we actually create beaver dams, right? And, you know, again, in places that don't, that don't have active beaver dams, uh, you know, you can pound a few posts into the stream bed, weave some willows and straw in there and basically create what's known as a, a beaver dam analog, a beaver mimicry structure. And again, just, you know, create the conditions uh, in which beavers can thrive. Because, you know, again, as I mentioned earlier, you know, when you lose all of the beaver dams in a stream, you know, and that stream becomes really, degraded and incised and it loses its floodplain connection, that's a really hard place to be a beaver, right? Because you've turned the stream into a fire hose essentially and the dam just gets blown out right away. So the beaver doesn't want to live there. So by, you know, by, by giving them a little bit of a starter kit, a, a little bit of a leg up, you know, you can create a situation in which the beavers are, are capable of, of surviving in a degraded stream until they can fix it and make it, make it uh, habitable for, for themselves. Uh, you know, of course, broken fingers are kind of the, the only occupational hazard of, of this uh, particular restoration technique. Um, and, you know, there, there's some great examples of beaver dam analogs, uh, you know, these beaver starter kits um, being used for, for restoration. Uh, you know, the kind of the, the premier case study uh, is out here in the Northwest in, in Oregon, um, where scientists built 115 of these beaver dam analogs. Uh, again, in, in a stream that historically had beavers, but where beavers were having a hard time recovering. Um, and, you know, with the help of these beaver dam analogs, uh, beavers built 120 uh, dams of their own. So, you know, the, again, the, the human scientists helped create the conditions where beavers could really thrive. Uh, you know, the inundated area, the amount of land that's underwater, right, more than doubled as beavers spread water out over the landscape. Uh, which filled all of these old side channels, right? So just turned the stream from being this, you know, very straight single threaded channel into this very you know, this beautiful kind of complex multi-threaded channel. Um, so, you know, beavers were really just profoundly changing the landscape again with some help from, uh, from these, these uh, human built starter kits. Um, and in this particular instance, uh, that, that all of that, all of those beaver dam analogs and the the real beaver dams that they encouraged uh, improved juvenile fish survival by 52%. So that, you know, just created all of this wonderful habitat uh, for, for baby steelhead, uh, you know, where, where once a kind of a, a boring, simple, single threaded channel had been, uh, they created this, you know, this wonderful, beautiful multi-threaded channel. It was just much more conducive um, to fish. So that's kind of a cool example of humans and beavers essentially partnering uh, to help protect uh, a, a federally threatened species. I think that's pretty cool. So I've been talking a lot, of course, about, you know, the, the benefits of beavers for uh, other species, but, you know, I think it's really important to emphasize that beavers create all kinds of fantastic ecosystem services for, for humans as well. Uh, and some of the best case studies or examples are, are in Nevada, uh, you know, especially in, in Elko County in, in Northeast Nevada. So if there are any folks from, you know, the, the northern, uh, the northern office listening, this is, you know, a good, a good story for you. Um, but, you know, the kind of the classic uh, example of beaver benefits occurred on, on Maggie Creek, which is, uh, you know, so a few streams, Maggie Creek, Susie Creek, um, a couple others, which are all, all part of the, the Humboldt uh, watershed. And there, you know, a century of just chronic cattle overgrazing had really degraded that you know that whole that whole system. Um, you know, of course, cattle left their own devices. You know, eat all the riparian vegetation, uh, which results in you know sort of a, a instability of the stream banks and again you know dramatic and catastrophic erosion and incision and you just end up with this kind of lifeless channel. Um, you know, as as you can see here in, in 1980. So uh, in this instance, you know, on, on Maggie Creek and Susie Creek and a couple others, uh, you know, the local ranchers in partnership with the Bureau of Land Management, 
kind of began to implement in the early 1990s a few pretty simple prescriptions for you know restoring uh, these these channels to health. That you know they fenced off some riparian areas. They changed the kind of the timing of, of grazing rotations. And uh, slowly, you know, in the 1990s, uh, the the vegetation began to recover. You know, willow and and uh, other other riparian veg started to grow back. And you know, you know, nobody had really had beavers in mind. Um, you know, when they when they undertook this restoration, but you know, the beavers have this kind of magical way of of finding uh, food sources and available habitats. The beavers showed up in the early 2000s. You know, built their dams and, and did what beavers do. Uh, and really restored the area. So this picture again, this is this is in 1980. Um, this is Maggie Creek, uh, you know, looking totally brown and, and lifeless. The next picture I'm going to show you is is the same same creek in 2017 uh, when I visited when I visited Elko County in the course of working on this book. So just keep this picture in mind, uh, and then check out this picture after you know, 20 years or so of beaver recovery. I think that's, I think that's pretty cool. Um, so you might look at this and say, well, wait a second, you know, where are the beavers? Well, all of this, all of this cattail growth here is growth atop an old beaver dam. So they're really, you know, deeply embedded in the system. Uh, and, you know, and here in, in this, in this stream, uh, researchers found that beavers added 20 acres of open water, right? So beavers are, again, they're spreading water out, they're creating ponds, they're turning, you know, a single threaded stream into this kind of you know, pond complex. Um, they added three miles of wetted stream length to the channel. So what does that mean? Well, you know, the, that stream is so degraded, it was actually going dry before reaching its confluence with the Humboldt River, right? So by building those dams and keeping, you know, slowing that water down and keeping water in the stream, beavers basically took a seasonal stream and made it perennial. I think that's pretty magical. So, you know, so oftentimes, you know, you'll hear farmers say or ranchers say, well, wait a second, you know, beaver, you know, beaver dams are stealing all our water, but right, but of course beavers aren't using that water, they're just slowing that water down and ensuring there still is water uh, in the stream, you know, by August and September. Uh, beavers also raised the water table by two feet, right? So, you know, when you look at a beaver pond, there's all of the visible surface water you see, but you don't see, you know, the, the weight of that pond forcing water into the ground, hydrating soils, you know, recharging aquifers, uh, I mean, any given beaver pond is storing much more water in the ground than it is in the in the, the surface water. Um, so beavers, you know, really dramatically raised the water table, hydrated the soils, uh, which led to a hundred more acres of riparian vegetation. So beavers were essentially irrigating this valley uh, at a, a pretty impressive scale. And you know, that's a big deal for for guys like this. This is James Rogers, uh, who's a rancher in Elko County. And uh, you know he's he's very pro beaver, and and the point that he made to me was that beavers were basically increasing forage production on his ranch by tenfold, right? Um, you know, and that means you know more weight on his cattle and and more more money in his back pocket. So you know, right there in Elko County, um, there's kind of this wonderful cluster of of, uh, of pro beaver ranchers because they've seen uh, you know the increased grass production uh, as well as of course you know these beaver ponds are, are wonderful uh, watering holes for their their cattle during times of drought. So you know, in in 2015, I believe was you know was, was sort of the that was kind of the catastrophic drought in Elko County, um, and you know the guys who the guys who didn't have beavers were uh, pulling their cattle off the range and the guys who did have beavers were leaving their cattle out there because you know beavers were, were creating creating water sources uh, in the desert. I think that's pretty remarkable. Uh, another wonderful beaver function is that they capture pollution, right? You know you get a, a big kind of slug of sediment, nitrogen, phosphorus, heavy metals from historic mining, what have you. You know that, that all of that stuff is being sus is, is suspended in the water column. But you know when that stream hits a hits a beaver dam, you know it's slowing the water down and giving all of that stuff a chance to filter out, right? So here you can see kind of this you know this beautiful cake of organic matter that's kind of built up behind this this beaver dam uh, over time. Uh, you know, and there have been studies showing uh, again a single pair of beavers capturing 100 tons of sediment, 15 tons of carbon, right? So they're sequestering huge amounts of carbon. Uh, you know, you, you sort of see comparable carbon sequestration in a beaver wetland as you do in a forest. So that's that's another cool thing that beavers do, uh, as well as a ton of nitrogen. So they're you know they're taking they're capturing all of this nitrogen pollution and helping to prevent dead zones uh, in you know the Great Lakes and Chesapeake Bay and Long Island Sound and Lake Tahoe. 
another wonderful beaver function is they slow down floods, right? So I, I think that's kind of the amazing thing about beavers is that, is that they, they help that, you know, you, get, you, you have these two polar opposite problems on the hydrograph, right? Floods and drought. And beavers help tackle both by stabilizing flows, right? So you get, you know, a big slug of, uh, of storm water racing down a stream, but it hits that that series of beaver dams and ponds, and it you know it spreads out laterally. It sinks into the ground. It's stored in the pond. Uh, so there have been studies showing beavers capturing about 30 percent uh, of the the rain, the the runoff uh, from any given storm. So you've got again, I think that's just kind of magical that you've got you know polar opposite problems: drought, flood, and beavers are helping us handle both of them. I think that's really remarkable. Uh, and then you know the kind of the, the final. Uh, really wonderful beaver ecosystem service that we're just beginning to understand now is that they're they're great at fighting fires, right? Of course, water doesn't burn, uh, and beavers by spreading water out are creating these wonderful fire refugia and fire breaks on the landscape. Here's a picture uh, from the Sharps Fire in Idaho in in uh, 20 was that 2017 2018, um, and you can see you know all of the the hillsides have just been burnt to a crisp, and the last green, wet, blue, lush place on the landscape is this, this beaver created valley bottom. Uh, so, you know, so that notion that beavers are, are creating these critical buffers against wildfire is, is increasingly being documented in the peer reviewed literature and, and is really starting to make, it, make its way into sort of planning conversations. And, you know, you, you sort of imagine, um, you know, a, a communities in California that are defended from fires by a kind of a critical buffer of beavers. I think it's a pretty exciting idea. So, you know, given all of the wonderful things that beavers do, why, why are we still so antagonistic toward them? Why do we still kill so many of them? And I, you know, I think that it, really it comes down to our lack of historical understanding and imagination. You know, when we killed 400 million beavers, we changed the landscape in ways that we just that we're just beginning to understand. Uh, so, you know, I think today a lot of us, you know, when we picture a stream, we think about something like this, you know, a kind of a free flowing, fast moving, cobble bottomed, single threaded channel, uh, you know, that you would see in Field and Stream magazine or an Orvis catalog or something. But, you know, historically, uh, we know that this kind of system, uh, you know, was, was much more rule than exception, that, you know, that a, a beaver system isn't necessarily, um, you know, what we think of when we picture a healthy stream, you know, there are dead and dying trees everywhere and it's the bottom is kind of squelchy and the water is, is not moving uh, and it smells sort of funky, um, you know, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, we know that, that this, again, this kind of system was, was really prevalent all over North America. So if we're going to fully embrace beavers and all we do, and all they do rather, you know, we have to kind of reconfigure our historical imagination uh, to make way for this kind of system uh, being, being the, the normal, healthy, natural one. So to sum it all up, you know, we've, we have this fantastic animal uh, that provides all of these wonderful services for other species and for human beings. Uh, it does it all for free. And best of all, it doesn't need permits. I think that's really nice too. So as the mantra of the beaver believer goes, it's time that we stepped back and let the rodent do the work. So with that, I'll, I'll say uh, thank you guys so much for your attention. We've got, I think there are a couple of questions in the chat, um, which I can get to. Um, you know, I did, uh, I did write this book, um, which uh, is, you know, if, if, if tonight did not answer every single beaver question, uh, the book, the book very well might. Um, and uh, there's my email address if you, have, if you have any other questions after the talk's over, or if you want to uh, order a signed copy of the book, uh, I would be more than more than happy to uh, send one your way. Um, and I'll put I'll put my email in the chat too. So with that, I'll say thanks a lot. And um, yeah, I've got some got some questions in the in the chat here. Um, let's see. Well, Skip asked if beavers were indigenous in the uh, Paranagat Valley. Um, Paranagat. Okay. Sorry, Paranagat. Yeah. I don't know where that is. Um, it is um, just north of Vegas, about two hours near the town of well, the town of Alamo, Nevada, sits in the Paranagat Valley. There's a wildlife refuge there. Um, I wouldn't rule it out that beavers were, <laughs> were indigenous to Paranagat Valley. I don't know. Personally, I don't know if there's any more beavers there, but. Yeah, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. I'd say I didn't even know how to pronounce that valley. So, so I, I, I don't know, but, you know, but certainly, um, you know, I think, I think if the, 
Um, of course, I'm a shameless beaver apologist, but I, I think the question is, were beavers present in a place, especially, you know, a, a river valley? Um, I think that the answer was most likely yes. You know, we're, I mean, we're just beginning for, for a long time, certainly, you know, beavers were considered non-native in, you know, in the high Sierras, for example. Um, and, you know, just in, in the last, uh, in the last 10 years or so, you know, now archaeologists are finding all of these ancient beaver chewed sticks and all of these high Sierra streams that have been carbon dated to many thousands of years ago. Um, so, you know, I, I think this was really a, a historically ubiquitous animal. The reason I asked that was because as I've gone through there, I've been, I've been in the valley for a very long time. And there used to be a lot more water in the Piranagate Valley and you can actually see a bathtub ring around that much like Lake Mead. And mm -hmm. I've seen over the years, these piles of sticks that were in the water and now they're completely out. There's several of them and they just remind me of the, the lodges I may have seen in Colorado and stuff, but it just seemed odd out there in the middle of the desert that there would be beaver lodges. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's, that's interesting. Yeah, that's that that sounds like a, a, a fantastic place, and I, I gotta I gotta go visit. Um, but I mean, you know, like and those, you know, I mean, like all of those those Humboldt River tributaries, for example, that you know where where beavers kind of returned on their own in the early two thousands. I mean, all of those, you know, all of those tributaries. Those, I mean, those are pretty, you know, pretty isolated places too, and you know, nobody's quite sure where those beavers came from. And it's you know, it's I think it's conceivable that they do. Yeah, they just, they just have kind of this remarkable way of getting back into these these really remote, isolated desert systems that you know you wouldn't um, wouldn't expect to find them. So um, yeah, I gotta go. I gotta go check that check that valley out. Um, Joy uh, said, since beavers are largely monogamous, when you relook at them, do you try not to break up the marriage, so to speak? And uh, yeah, that's absolutely absolutely right, Joy. Um, you know anybody who's anybody who's trapping and relocating beavers is trying to capture the entire family, not just the not just the the adult mating pair, but all of the kits uh, as well. Uh, you know if you move the kits without their their parents, they'll, they'll almost certainly die. So you want to move the entire family together. Uh, and in fact, ma in many cases, you know that lots of beaver relocation projects not only avoid breaking up marriages, they actually try to create new marriages. Um, so you know if you capture uh, a male and a female, you know on their own, if so a lot, you know, a lot of the beavers that you that you capture are going to be those two-year-old dispersing beavers, right? They're like teenagers. They're you know they're going off. They're trying to find their own place to live. They're getting in trouble. They you know they end up in somebody's irrigation ditch or a, you know a stock pond or something. Um, so when that happens, uh, you know, a lot of these projects try to pair up, uh, you know, young solo males and females and and create uh, you know kind of a stable couple. Because if you know if you if you move a beaver by himself, he's just going to go wandering around looking for looking for a mate and probably get eaten by a cougar or something. Uh, you know, if you move that that compatible couple, they'll just settle down and start building right away where you put them. At least that's the that's the hope. So yeah, you always want to move beavers together if if possible. So that's a good good question, Joy. Um, Jim mentioned Beaver Dam State Park. Uh, I, I don't know, I don't know where that is, but that sounds cool. Oh, yeah. Um, I think it was in response to Joy's other question. She said, or they said, do you know if they currently exist in any stream systems in southern Nevada? Oh, yeah. You know, I, I, yeah, it's, 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 it's funny. I, I don't, I don't actually know a whole lot about, about um, the southern Nevada beaver situation. I've, you know, again, I've spent, I've spent a lot of time up, up in, up in Elko County and, and northern Nevada, but, um, you know, most of my, my visits to Las Vegas have, you know, have been, uh, stupid bachelor parties <laughs> so i gotta i gotta i gotta get out and, and ex explore explore some uh, some southern nevada beaver beaver streams that, that sounds like fun i have a little bit of an answer to that yeah. um i used to work at clark county wetlands park which if you live here it's in the eastern um side of the valley and they definitely do have beavers there at the park um they actually go on beaver walks um they have them a few times a month Got to get up the crack of dawn and go because that's the only time you're going to see them. But they do have some, they do have lots of beavers there and they have some very big beavers there. So, oh, so yeah, there's, there's lots down here, apparently. <laughs> yeah, so actually beavers have been recolonizing the Colorado River system and they can now be found in virtually all of the tributaries to the Colorado River, um, at least down to Hoover Dam. I don't know if they've got any south of there. Um, so yeah, all of Las Vegas Wash, you know, the Virgin River, all these places um, have beaver. And uh, 
Meadow Valley Wash comes down out of Caliente is full of beaver. That's um, kind of on the, the east side of Southern Nevada, um, over by the, the Utah border. Um, and undoubtedly they were in the Pranagat Valley. I don't know that there's there, if they're there now or not. But I think that the structures that Skip's referring to are actually uh, bulldozed up piles of uh, debris from, mm -hmm. from clearing the, the pond basins. Uh, but they've got muskrats, so they'll probably have beaver before too long. Okay. That, thank, thanks, Jim. That's 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 really that's really helpful. And yes, yeah, I've, I've certainly seen uh, you know plenty of beavers in the, in, in the Grand Canyon and and uh, the Virgin and other other parts of the, the Colorado Basin. And um, it's great to know that they're that they're making they're making a comeback in uh, Las Vegas Wash. That's fantastic. Um, and when I when I come down next, Jim, I'll, I'll ask I'll ask you for a beaver tour. You, you seem like you've got the, the local knowledge. <laughs> Um, and then I guess that, you know, the final question there is, is Grace asked, uh, and thank you for saying that you enjoyed the book, Grace. Um, Grace asked how I decided to study beavers. Uh, and, you know, from, I mean, for me, uh, you know, so I grew up in, in, uh, in, in New York, um, in New York State in the Hudson Valley. And, and uh, you know, growing up, it was, you know, we spent a lot of time in the Catskills and the Adirondacks, which are some of the, some of the, the more beavery places uh, in the lower 48. So, you know, certainly around them uh, from a young age and was, was always into them. Um, but, uh, you know, my sort of my full conversion to, to beaver believer uh, began in, in 2014. I was, I was um, living in Seattle. I was working for a, a magazine called High Country News, which some of you, some of you guys probably subscribe to, um, you know, covering, covering wildlife in the Northwest. Uh, and I, I saw a flyer for a, a beaver workshop. And I, and I didn't know what a beaver workshop entailed, but it sounded like fun. And, uh, you know, I went to this, this, this conference, essentially, um, outside of Seattle, and it was just you know it was just one scientist after another getting up and and sort of saying their piece about why beavers were so crucial for you know fish habitat and wildfire mitigation and carbon sequestration and you know f f fluvial geomorphology, uh, and I, I sort of realized wow this you know this this animal that you know I kind of grew up canoeing around. Uh, is actually one of the kind of the primary movers and shakers of, of North American ecosystems, and and um, you know so that so that summer I spent a bunch of time hanging out with beaver people and wrote a couple of stories for for High Country News about about beavers, and and uh, those stories eventually turned into the book. So it's yeah, it's been this kind of this wonderful journey of of, uh, of discovery and and realization, and you know I mean I mean it's just amazing how much the beaver community has grown even in the you know, the seven or eight years that I've been a member of it, um, it just seems like, you know, every every uh, week I learn about a different uh, beaver project starting up in, in some Western state, um, as well as in Europe too, you know, there's, there's a, there, there's a, there are Eurasian beavers, um, there's kind of a, a parallel or analogous movement uh, to, you know, rewild beavers throughout uh, Europe and, and uh, even much of Western Asia. Um, so it's just a really exciting time to be in the, in the beaver world right now. No question. Yeah, please. I had heard um, from somebody once that there was an experiment done where some, some scientists left out like speakers that um, were playing like the sound of flowing water. Right. Um, and the next day, beavers had covered up the speakers as if there was actually water there. And so it sounds like a big component of, beaver, of beavers building their dam. Yeah, that's your um, you're ex exactly right, Clary. That 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 experiment did did happen. Um, so certainly, there's a, a very powerful um, you know kind of auditory trigger there. Uh, the sound of running water is definitely a, a dam building cue. I heard, I heard a good story recently from a a, um, a biologist who who was telling me that you know he he had a he was he, he had a captive beaver uh, in the first floor of this this two story building. Um, and uh, somebody in the, the second story flushed a toilet and the water is, you know, running through the pipes and the beaver just suddenly looks up very <laughs> alertly. Um, but, you know, it's interesting. There's, there's, there's also, so, so I think, I think for a long time, you know, people thought that, that sound was the primary or maybe even the only trigger um, for dam building behavior. But there's a really cool, there's, a, there's actually a wildlife rehabber um, who has uh, she has a, a, a YouTube channel and like a, a TikTok uh, page where, where she posts all of these videos of a beaver that she's rehabilitating. Um, and I think, the, I think the beaver is named Justin Beaver. Um, and uh, and what, what she has shown is that this, the beaver has a very powerful compulsion to take you know, dirty clothes or other objects 
and build little dams in door frames, right? So, you know, so, so in a house, you know, the, right, the wall is the dam and the door frame is the leak in the dam. So there's, so, you know, of course there's no auditory stimulus there. So obviously there's a, a visual trigger as well. So I thought that was, I thought that was really cool that, you know, we could actually learn a lot about fever behavior from watching TikToks. Uh, that just, that just kind of fascinated me. All right. Is there anything else that you'd like to say to close us out, Ben? Uh, no, just again, thank you so much. I, I was, yeah, it was, it was um, very, it was cool to briefly learn about a, a little bit of, uh, of beaver, beaver local context that certainly I, I didn't know. And, and uh, if I, next time I find myself in, in the Vegas area, I'll, 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 I'll get in touch and would, would love to uh, see some, some local beaver infrastructure. That sounds fantastic. Absolutely. All right. So on that note, we'll close it out for the evening. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. And a big thank you for Ben for taking the time to speak with us. Just want to remind everybody that Friends of Nevada Wilderness is a membership-based organization. Over 80% of the donations we receive go directly to advocating for wilderness protection, restoring habitat for wildlife, and maintaining hiking trails. We'd love for you to become a member and join us in keeping Nevada wild and beautiful. Also, just a reminder to everybody, the Wild and Scenic Film Festival is on Saturday. You can still purchase your tickets online until tomorrow night. And then if you want to come, you'll have to buy your ticket at the venue. Um, if you are attending, um, just wanted to let everybody know to bring warm layers. It's going to get pretty chilly up there after the sun goes down. Um, but we have a lot of information up on our FAQ page on the event uh, website as well. Um, that will be nevadawilderness.org forward slash WSFF 2021. And lastly, remember that we hold the Wild Speaker Series every first Thursday of the month with various outdoors topics. Um, we'll be taking a break in November because the first Thursday of November is Veterans Day. Um, and it's a holiday, so we just want, we're going to take a break. But mark your calendars for December 2nd. We'll be, we will be joined by Amy Ridledge with the Wilderness Land Trust, and she will be talking about wilderness land acquisition in Nevada. And that's all we've got for you. Thank you guys. Have a good night.